Hello, everyone. Welcome to the AWS ASEAN Summit 2022. Thanks for spending time with us today. My name is Aarti, and I'm a Principal Solutions Architect with AWS, focused on serverless technologies. I will be joined on stage later today by my colleague, Julia, and Wang Siong, who is Staff Software Engineer at Shopback. In today's talk, we'll discuss the central role of integration in modern applications and how event-driven integration helps you build resilient applications. We will then look at common event-driven architecture patterns and AWS services to implement these. And finally, we'll hear from AWS customer Shopback on how they are using integration services to build resilient microservices. Now, integrating two systems means to connect them so they can communicate with each other. So the need to integrate is not really new and has existed ever since we started building distributed applications. For example, a REST API is a common way to integrate front-end with back-end business logic. So if integration as a concept is not new, why is it so important in the context of modern applications? So let's consider a microservices architecture, which is one of the design principles of modern applications. In microservices, a single application is made up of multiple services, and this increases the number of integrations you need to build. Now, how these services are integrated defines essential system properties, such as how does it scale? How resilient is it to failure? And how easy is it to change? So this degree of dependence between services is referred to as coupling. Now, in this diagram, if a change in system A also causes system B to change, then A and B are tightly coupled. But if A and B can change independently and still continue to communicate with each other, they are decoupled. Now, decoupling introduces new design and runtime considerations, which we will explore when we discuss architecture patterns. Now, an important takeaway here is that coupling is not an all or nothing design choice because there can be various degrees of coupling between two systems. Also, systems can be coupled along multiple dimensions. As an example, if we choose JSON as the data format for communication between A and B, then they have a data format dependency on JSON. Let's also say we choose REST as the communication protocol. Then A and B have an interaction style dependency on REST. Our talk will focus on the aspect of temporal or time-based dependency, whether system A expects a response from system B in near real time or not. In other words, whether the interaction is synchronous or asynchronous. Now, event-driven communication is asynchronous in nature. To understand the benefits of asynchronous communication, it is important to understand how it works. So before we look at asynchronous, let's review synchronous communication. So here, the receiver processes a request as soon as it arrives from the sender. If there are no processing errors, it will return a successful response. Now the sender, must wait till the receiver is done processing. But with asynchronous communication, there is an additional component or an integration service between the sender and the receiver. Now here, the sender gets a confirmation as soon as the request is reliably stored by this component, and the receiver processes the request at its own pace. Now let's take a closer look at the design implications of this. In synchronous integration, if there is a processing error, the request fails and it is up to the sender to handle this. But with asynchronous, since request is stored first, it gives an opportunity for the receiver to recover from transient processing errors, such as a network glitch. Second, the sender sees a response faster and is not blocked waiting for the processing to complete. Third, the receiver need not process events at the same rate at which they are being sent. So to understand this, consider an example of an online retail store who are running a sale. Now the order microservice may receive thousands of orders per second, but the fulfillment microservice does not have to process at the same rate. 
because shipping an order out at best takes a few hours. So this is a great way to optimize cost without compromising the customer SLA. And now finally, this simplifies running processes in parallel. So if we continue on the retail example, an order placed will trigger fulfillment, invoicing, and probably forecasting workflows. Now all these microservices can kick off in parallel once the order is placed. So now that we've seen the benefits of asynchronous integration, Julia is going to walk you through how you can design this on AWS and will importantly cover design trade-offs you should consider. Over to you, Julia. Thank you, Aarti. Hi, everyone. I'm Julia, a solutions architect at AWS focused on digital native customers. I will take you through how you can architect microservices on AWS using asynchronous integration. For our discussion, we will use the terms messages and events interchangeably to represent data exchanged between microservices. The first pattern we'll look at is queuing. Queues are used to connect two services together, or in other words, for point-to-point -point communication. Messages sent by the sender are stored in the queue, and the receiver periodically posts to process a batch of messages each time. Once successfully processed, messages are deleted from the queue. To scale the throughput, you can increase the number of receivers as each message is only delivered to one receiver. Let's look at the new design considerations that this pattern introduces. The first is, after a message is processed, it needs to be sent back to the sender. So we need an identifier to correlate a response to the message that generated it. Second, if the receiver encounters a brief outage, Recovery takes longer because it has to clear the messages waiting in the queue. To solve this, you can temporarily increase the number of receivers to catch up. Finally, if you have multiple senders, you need a way to make sure that a sender with large volume of messages does not take up all the capacity and impact the performance for senders with lower volumes of messages. You can handle this by moving large customers to dedicated queues with their own set of receivers. There are two services you can use to implement a queue-based architecture on AWS. The first is Amazon SQS. This is serverless, which means that it is completely managed, scales seamlessly, and you pay for value. If messages cannot be delivered or fail to be processed, you can send them to a separate queue called a date letter queue or DL queue. We recommend using SQS for architecting point-to-point -point integration in applications that have been built ground up on AWS. You also have the option of Amazon MQ, which is a managed message broker for two popular open source products, Apache Active MQ and Revit MQ. This is a good fit if you are already self-hosting these message brokers on AWS or are considering migrating workloads that use these message brokers or industry standard APIs such as Java Messaging Service or JMS to the cloud. That way, you can benefit from the reduced overhead of a managed service without having to rewrite your applications. The second pattern is the Publish Subscribe pattern or PubSub for short. This is ideal when you want the same message to be processed by multiple downstream consumers. Here, a copy of each message is delivered to all receivers. Interested receivers will subscribe to a topic and messages are pushed out to them. The first two design considerations for this pattern are the same as that of the queue pattern. The third point mentioned in the design considerations refers to how messages are delivered only after the receiver subscribes to a topic. This means that historical messages sent will not be re-delivered and messages are not persisted. You can use Amazon SNS to implement this pattern on AWS. SNS is also serverless, so it is completely managed, scales automatically with a pay-for-value pricing model. 
You can control the messages delivered to a receiver by filtering based on message attributes set by the sender. You can also provide strict ordering and exactly one's delivery using first in, first out or FIFO topics. The next pattern is event bus. Unlike the PubSub pattern, which broadcasts a message to all subscribers, here we can control the delivery or routing of messages to specific receivers using rules by inspecting message attributes and payloads. To illustrate using the diagram, the sender routes a message to a receiver based on its color attribute. This can be done by embedding the routing logic within the sender application code. But this quickly gets hard to scale as you add more receivers and message colors. Every time you add another receiver or a new message color, you have to update the sender code. This increases location coupling. By location coupling, we mean that the sender has to know the address or location of all downstream receivers and exactly how to reach them. We can handle this by offloading the routing logic and delivery to a dedicated message router or event bus. This is, however, still a tighter coupling as compared to the SNS and SQS patterns that we saw earlier because there is the additional overhead of writing the routing rules. On AWS, you can implement this pattern using Amazon Event Bridge. Event Bridge supports JSON events. You can route to AWS services as well as any web service that is hosted on premises or even a SaaS application using API destinations. Event Bridge also has built in schema registry that simplifies the tracking of event schema evolution over time. With these three patterns in mind, you can combine different patterns to achieve more complex flows. One example is a scatter gather pattern. Consider the use case where you integrate with multiple downstream systems to respond to a customer request. For example, a travel meta search platform needs to query your various travel partners to return all available options for hotel booking at a given destination. In other words, a single search request results in calling multiple partner APIs or a scatter of requests. Once you receive the results, you then have to aggregate or gather them before returning consolidated results to the client. One way to achieve this is to use SNS to scatter the requests and SQS to gather the results. This pattern is a good fit if you want a large fan out and loose coupling between senders and receivers. For the scatter step, you can also implement the same pattern using Event Bridge. Event Bridge is a good fit if you need to write complex routing logic, and also if your receivers are already hosted on AWS. It does result in a somewhat tighter coupling, as you need to write a new rule each time you onboard a new receiver. Also, since each rule can target a maximum of five receivers, the fanout is lower than that of SNS. A third option to implement scattergather is to use AWS step functions. Let's take a quick look at what step functions is before we look at the architecture pattern. Step functions is a managed workflow orchestrator. Workflow here is just the series of steps that make up a business process. The two main building blocks of step functions are states that represent the actual work done and transitions that represent a move from one state to another. You can use the Workflow Studio to design your workflows with an easy drag and drop interface. Step Functions supports AWS SDK integration, which means you have access to over 200 services and 9,000 API actions for states. In addition, you can offload state management, error handling, and retries to Step Functions so that you only have to focus on the business logic within the states. Since we now know what step functions is, let's reconsider the meta search use case. Let's say that information about all our downstream partners are stored in a DynamoDB table. After retrieving the partners, we can trigger off search requests in parallel using the map state in step functions. Step functions will wait for all branches of our map state to finish and aggregate the results and pass it on to the last step, which formats and filters the results for display. However, separately, I would like to point out 
that unlike services like SNS or EventBridge, where we can easily see the downstream receivers through subscriptions or rules, we don't have that level of visibility with step functions. Instead, we need to examine the state machine definition to understand the integrations. Now that we have reviewed different architecture patterns, let's hear from AWS customer shop back on how they use some of these patterns for their application. Thank you, Julia. Hi, I'm Siyong, staff engineer at Shopback. Today, I'm going to talk about how we're going to integrate a new feature we have recently built onto our existing systems and using async communication to create a decoupled system that can run at scale. So recently, our team has built a new feature called Shopback Pay. How it works is that merchants can offer customer a new way of paying just by allowing customer to scan a static or dynamic QR code, the customer can then pay the merchant using a payment method that is linked to their Shopback account. Furthermore, they get to enjoy the loyalty perks with the merchant and even offset their purchase with the existing cashback that they have in the Shopback app. And if you have not tried Shopback Pay yet, we are currently having a 100% cashback campaign and we are happy to have well-known artist Annette Lee as our brand ambassador. Terms and conditions apply. Shopback backend systems are built on top of AWS. Traffic from our mobile apps and website across our 10 countries goes into country-specific EKS clusters. Our compute workloads are running on Kubernetes, and we use heavily on AWS infrastructure such as CloudWatch, OpenSearch, Elastic Cache, SNS, SQS, EventBridge, RDS, and many more. Back when we were designing the system for Shopback Pay, this is how our service architecture looked like. Most of our existing microservices are running HTTP endpoints behind an API gateway, and the requests are processed synchronously. As you can see, a request can call another service and potentially another service in order to fulfill the request of the caller. With each layer, the reliability drops due to network or service failure. To improve the reliability, we add retries to mitigate temporary network failures. However, that may increase latency and it gets more complicated to manage when handling traffic spikes. Shopback Pay has to also work with our existing suites of services that our users are familiar with. This is so that the user sees Shopback Pay as an integrated product that works with the existing suite of Shopback product features. And he or she will enjoy the same perks that they have with other existing journeys they are familiar with. This means that our new services need to integrate with many existing systems, such as to get payment methods with our payment gateway service, to make progression with our install loyalty reward system, and also to be included in the same settlement flow for our merchants, among many others. If we were to design Shopback Pay to run synchronously, the Shopback Pay service will act as an orchestration service to facilitate the processing of a QR transaction with other internal services. Firstly, it has to validate the transaction with our merchant information service to see if it can proceed. Then, process the payment with our payment gateway service. After which, if successful, it will have to progress our loyalty rewards and give out any rewards with our loyalty service. And lastly, we also need to record the transaction with our merchant reporting service so that the merchant sees the transaction on a dashboard and also in the settlement report. Even though presented here is a simplified diagram, you can immediately see a lot of potential issues that can come up with this. Firstly, the latency of the call is equal to the accumulated latency of all the internal network calls. If any of the internal services are saturated and the replies are slower, the user's experience will be impacted. Secondly, let's say the loyalty service becomes unresponsive. The question now is, do we need to reverse the payment transaction so that the user can retry? Or 
to have a recovery mechanism to reprocess the loyalty progression. And we have to do the same for the billing in order to ensure that we still bill the merchant correctly. Apart from the network issue that it has to handle, the payment life cycle has also become very complicated. The system has to ensure that all transactions complete its journey and end up in a proper final state. It will also have recovery processes to, in order to pick up any transaction left in any of the transitional state and resolve to a final state within a reasonable time. It is also very hard to add new features or new flows as, as it further increases the number of complexity of the states and also number of recovery processes. However, if you just focus on the core life cycle that shopback pay service need to facilitate, you can immediately see that the number of states become much less and is so much more manageable. This reduced complexity also allows us to analyze failure scenarios much easier, which means less chance of having a bug in the system. Let's look again at the sequence diagram if we design it asynchronously. We will still need to validate the transaction and to process the payment. But this time, we do not need to call loyalty service and merchant reporting service before returning the call to the user. Shopback Pay Service will instead emit a payment event after it is done processing, and both loyalty service and merchant reporting service will process the event afterward without affecting the user's experience. This is how we imagine the architecture to look like. Shopback Pay Service now facilitates the critical transaction flow and emits payment events into an event bus. Any other services that needs to be notified on the payment event, subscribe to the event bus and make changes within their own system, and thus do not block the user making the payment itself. Here are some options we have considered when designing an event, event bus. Option A is using a Redis PubSub. It is a very simple model and would work well, even up to a certain scale. However, to manage the infrastructure is an overhead, and we are looking for something that can scale elastically and be cost-effective when handling traffic spikes. We do not want to pre-scale to a high level for extended period of time, nor do we want to manage the scaling up and down frequently to optimize for costs. Option B is to use SNS topic and SQS to subscribe to the topic. And we can fan out by subscribing more SQS to the topic. It does fulfill our needs of scaling elastically. However, it does not have filtering of messages. This means all my consumer have to process all the events, even if it was only looking for a subset of events. Option C is to use EventBridge. It has message filtering and also have different targets that it can trigger, such as HTTP endpoints, SQS, and even triggering of Lambda functions, which makes integration easier. And eventually, this is the choice that we have chosen. And with all system design choices, there are trade-offs. First, we start with the positives. Firstly, it decouples the producer of events and the consumer who are interested in those events. It is also very easy to add and modify the rules to extend to new features and services. The different targets also makes it easy to integrate. Content-based filtering is a very powerful feature to filter based on the JSON body. EventBridge can retry failed calls and also have date letter queues to store messages that cannot be processed. Some negatives include that the rules can get complicated and you might misconfigure and end up setting up the filter wrongly. This may result in the event not being sent to the target and it, it is not straightforward to detect if a message failed to be triggered by any of the rules. It also has slightly higher latency as compared to SNS. But in our case, the latency is within acceptable range as the downstream system does not need to respond to the event so quickly. However, if you are optimizing for low latency, this is something to consider. 
There are also event breach quotas to be aware of. And AWS has good documentation on the limits when using event breach. One of them is there are only 300 rules per event bus allowed. So if you are putting all the events into a single event bus and doing many routing on it, you may hit the limit. You can of course set up multiple event bus to bypass these limits. And with that, that concludes the end of my presentation. You have seen how using async can dramatically reduce complexity and the pros and cons of using event bridge. I will pass on the time back to Ati. Thanks for sharing Shopback's journey with Integration Services, Siong. So in this session, we started with the benefits of asynchronous integration, then looked at event-driven architecture patterns to decouple applications, and finally, a real-world implementation of an event-driven microservices architecture at Shopback. We discussed AWS integration services and design considerations for choosing the appropriate service. Event-driven serverless architectures enable your application to seamlessly scale and also benefit from pay-as-you-go pricing and minimal operational overhead. If you want to learn more about architecture patterns and resources to get you up to speed with serverless on AWS, visit serverlessland.com. Before you go, here are more learning resources to develop your AWS cloud skills. Skill Builder is our online learning center that offers over 500 free digital courses in up to 16 languages. So as you build your skills, consider preparing for one of our 11 AWS certifications. These industry-recognized certifications span foundational, professional, and speciality levels to validate AWS knowledge and skills. We invite you to join the AWS Certified Community, which brings together AWS Certified Practitioners and Builders in an exclusive online community. Please do take a few minutes to complete the online survey to ensure we continue to deliver content that is most relevant to you. And with that, Julia, Siong, and I would like to thank you for spending time with us. <laughs>